Um, hi, um, my name is Osama. Uh, I'm part of the kernel team at TikTok. And today I'll be talking about improving kernel boot time. So um, we will start with the reason why uh, boot time is important. We will mostly focus on the host kernel live update use case. Um, then we'll go through some of the different optimizations uh, that have been done to improve boot time. Um, this not only includes uh, optimizations in code paths that all machines would go through, but also specialized optimizations, for example, um, in huge pages and BCI devices. Um, and then we'll conclude with if there's anything more that we can do to improve boot time and what are the large areas of boot time left. Um, so, starting with the motivation, uh, why do we want to improve kernel boot time? Um, so, in both private and public clouds, once workloads are started, once virtual machines are run, um, people don't really want the host environment to change. Um, so, they don't really want to upgrade the host kernel and try to keep it the same as long as possible. But um, updating the host kernel, um, so updating the host kernel can cause severe disruption, especially if it results in a very large downtime for the virtual machine. Um, but updating host kernel brings about obvious security, functionality, and performance benefits, um, which not all of the alternative methods like uh, um, kernel patching can deliver, which is mostly meant to be for um, critical security fixes, uh, bug fixes. Um, so there are two ways to upgrade the host kernel. One is a uh, live migration and the other one is live update. Um, so we'll briefly go through live migration in this slide. Um, live migration is the process, I guess most of you will know live migration is the process of moving a uh, running virtual machine from one physical host to another without causing too much disruption. Um, it has one very big advantage over the other method we'll discuss uh, is that it can be used to deal with um, physical hardware issues, um, but this is not a problem over here because um, um, it's not a problem over here because what we are trying to focus on is host kernel live updates, and you won't try to update the kernel on a machine that has physical issues. Um, however, it does come with quite a few challenges and costs. Um, in terms of resources, the most critical resource used in live migration is the network. Um, so all the data of the VM, including its state, um, its memory, and even this data in non-shared migration needs to be migrated over network. So uh, network bandwidth is a large requirement for live migration. Um, so the speed of the network connection and its bandwidth directly impact the speed and success of the live migration. And a slow or congested network can lead to quite large pro prolonged migration times. You, you also need to have a separate machine to transfer the virtual machine to, and that's, you need a separate machine just to update the host kernel, which is not quite nice, I guess. Um, the second thing is that you need to deal with the performance impacts on the virtual machine. For example, in post copy live migration, um, if the virtual machine tries to access a page uh, that uh, has not yet been transferred, to the target, uh, then it will cause uh, a page fault or a network fault that goes over network to the source and tries to fetch the page. And if there are too many network faults, then the application on the target VM will slow down. Um, and live migration also has quite a lot of complexity built in. For example, if the network fails, then you need to checkpoint and go back to the source. So there are issues with live migration. Uh, so the other method of updating the host kernel is live update. Um, this works by pausing and snapshotting the virtual machines running on the host, um, then k-exec booting into the new kernel, and then restoring and resuming the virtual machines. The biggest advantage is that you don't need all the re extra resources that you need in live migration. So you don't need um, all the extra machines. You don't need all the extra bandwidth uh, that you needed with live migration. Um, however, this does come with a few issues. Uh, 
just as a comparison to live migration, you can't use this to deal with physical hardware issues, but this is not a problem we're trying to uh, solve here. We're just trying to update the host kernel. Then uh, a second problem is uh, the large downtime that the VM will encounter uh, with live host kernel live update. Um, and this is what we'll try to solve in the rest of the presentation. There are other issues as well. For example, um, if a PCI device is passed to a virtual machine through VFI or pass through, uh, then you need to preserve its IOMMU states. Um, my colleague Fab uh, from TikTok tried to present a solution for this in KVM form uh, using persistent kernel memory. Um, it's linked in the slide if anyone's interested. Uh, there's another issue with uh, host user space applications like DPDK and SPDK. So you'll need to restart them and they can have a large restart time. Um, I tried to present a solution for this as well uh, in DPDK form last year. So that's linked in the slide as well. Um, so what's, uh, what's involved in the downtime uh, while, live up, while doing a live update? So downtime is the process of, um, uh, so it's a total time added by snap pausing the VM plus the time to snapshot the VM plus the time to reboot the VM into the new kernel plus the time to restore and resume the VM. And uh, our experiment in our experiment, we found that the largest time was taken by KXEC reboot. And that's what we'll try to focus on in the rest of the presentation. Um, before we go into making optimizations and measuring time, um, just wanted to say how we measured downtime. So the total downtime for the virtual machine is measured as the time gap when the guest VM could not transfer data or network to an external machine. And the kernel boot time is just measured from the kernel timestamp logs. So it's from the first log that gives the kernel version to the log which says that it's running the init process. Um, this slide also contains details of the test machine we are using. Um, it has 128 uh, Intel CPUs across two sockets and 512 gigs across 512 NEMA nodes. Uh, 512 gigs across two NEMA nodes. Um, so in order to get a good uh, idea of which subsystem takes a large amount of time to boot, uh, we can create an SVG bar charts uh, of, the, of the kernel log where each uh, color in the chart represents um, a kernel timestamp log. Um, in this slide, we can see that uh, without any changes or optimizations in the kernel, it took just about four seconds for the kernel to boot to init. And um, we see in the highlighted red boxes that the largest amount of time was taken for the initialization of struct pages. It's uh, about 40% of the total boot time. Uh, so the solution to optimize this was quite simple. Uh, just enable the deferred struct page init config option. Um, this defers the initialization of struct pages from um, a single thread at boot to Parallel threads, um, to, uh, to parallel threads when the kernel swap daemon starts. Um, the biggest time now left uh, from boot was SMP boot time. Uh, that's also highlighted in the red box in the slide, which was more than 50% of the total boot time. So this was the next uh, target for the optimization. Um, so before we go into the optimization for SMP boot, uh, just a little bit of how SMP boot works on the Linux kernel. Um, up until 6.4, I think, uh, the CPU is booted serially one after the other. And during CPU boot, each uh, secondary CPU goes through a state machine. Um, and the state machine is divided into different sections, each having different states. So. Uh, the first section is the prepare section, uh, which in which the boot CPU, your primary CPU, tries to um, set up your secondary CPUs, uh, uh, the, 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 the secondary CPU that is being online. Uh, the next section is the starting section, where the online CPU sets itself up going through different states with interrupts disabled. And then in the last section, called the online section, uh, the online CPU sets itself up with interrupts and preemption enabled. 
Um, so when the time taken for uh, the CPU to go through each of these state was measured, it was found that the largest amount of time was taken with the BPKK AP stage. So that's highlighted in the red box in the um, enum for EPU uh, for the enum for uh, CPU states. Um, so this state um, this state is uh, where the boot processor boot processor just sends a startup and in its IPI to the secondary cores. Um, and then waits for them to come back online. Um, and this was taking a very, very large chunk of time in SMP boots. Um, so when I checked on the kerning mailing list, uh, I found that David Woodhouse from Amazon had uh, already proposed a solution to parallelize BP kick AP stage. So rather than kicking a single secondary CPU, waiting for it to come online and then kicking the next CPU, waiting for it to come online and so on. Um, you would kick all the CPUs together and then uh, wait for them to reach a synchronization point. So it's parallel SMP boot. Um, so when I was looking at improving kernel boot time, um, there hadn't been much activity on these patches for almost a year. Uh, so I tried to restart the discussion with a lot of help from David. Um, but there were still a few issues. Uh, and in the end, uh, Thomas reworked the patches, uh, fixed issues with microcode loading uh, when hybrid threading was enabled, uh, did a lot of refactoring. Um, and then it was merged. So if you get the latest kernel release, uh, you have um, parallel SMP boots enabled by default. Um, so this is the SVG chart after you have enabled parallel SMP boots. You can see the kernel boot time went down from 2.7 seconds to one second, and the SMP boot time became almost negligible. So now, um, a small diversion to using huge pages. Um, up until now, no huge pages were reserved at boot time, but there are applications like DBDK and SPDK that uh, want to use huge pages to be reserved at boot time because after boots, there might be a memory fragmentation and they might not all be available. Um, so we tried to reserve 500 one gig huge pages um, and you can see that the optimized boot time went from one second back to four seconds. This happens because uh, the struct page initialization and preparation for the tail struct pages of a huge page cannot be delivered even with uh, the deferred struct page op init option enabled because they need to be available at boot time. Um, the main reason that these extra three seconds were added were uh, at, at boot time was there are about 260,000 tail struct pages initialized per one gig huge page. Uh, most of these, all, almost all of these tail struct pages contain exactly the same information. So there's an optimization in the kernel called huge page vmap optimization that uh, frees those tail struct, tail struct pages. Um, just so that the system has more memory. Um, so the question is, if those tail struct pages just needed to be freed later on, why do we need to initialize them? Um, so um, I sent a path series so that uh, you only initialize the tail struct pages after HVO is attempted and only if HVO fails, which it usually <laughs> doesn't. So you don't, and then you usually don't end up initializing or preparing the tail struct pages. Um, after this optimization, um, so yeah, those patches were merged in the mainline kernel. I think they should be in the next release, or they are probably in the kernel release. Uh, so if you, um, so after this, uh, the boot time, even with using 500 uh, one gig huge pages, was brought down from four seconds back down closer to one second. Um, and yeah, the struct page initialization was or time was uh, uh, reduced by almost three seconds. Uh, so after all the optimizations we have discussed, the total VM downtime is still between one and a half and two seconds. And about 70% of that is represented by kernel boot time. Um, so you might be asking if that, that doesn't seem like a lot, one and a half, two seconds, but uh, there are a lot of applications, especially in machine learning and networking that have, um, very low latency requirements. 
Uh, for example, in production, a lot of databases that run, um, if the P99 latency over a specific period goes uh, above 100 milliseconds, uh, alarms start going off. So one and a half, two seconds is quite a lot, even though it doesn't sound like it. Um, and I think in public clouds as well, uh, users might start noticing it if you start updating the host kernel. And um, so the question is, can we do more? Um, this slide covers purgatory, which is not really part of kernel boot time, but um, it is part of the kernel source code and contributes to the total downtime. So purgatory is the piece of code that runs between your old kernel and your new kernel. And its main task is to do that shard 56 checksum, um, uh, the shard 56 integrity check for the new kernel. Um, if we disable purgatory, we save 200 milliseconds. That's 20% of the total um, downtime. I tried to upstream this uh, and I got a lot of pushback. Uh, I was told that the saving of 200 milliseconds does not justify uh, disabling the integrity check. Um, in my opinion, um, having a config option for that is not a bad idea. Um, Especially, for example, in production environments, there are a lot of canary tests that are run before doing kernel updates, so you would know if things would go wrong. Uh, so, it, I, it actually, it would be good to hear your thoughts about if there's if it's a, if it's something that's desirable. Um, okay, yeah. So, looking back at kernel boot time, um, approximately 120 milliseconds was taken up by PCI devices. Um, on the machine that I'm testing on, uh, there were 57 unique PCI devices and only 15 of them were actually needed to boot the host, boot the virtual machine, and then provide networking and storage to the virtual machine. Uh, we made some changes so that um, we could filter out using kernel command line which PCI devices uh, were probed and then the subsequent operations were done. Um, and that brought the boot time down by 8%. This is a much more specialized optimization. You would need to know what software is run on your host, your virtual machine, and all its requirements. So it's not a general purpose optimization. It's not what a lot of people would do, but it's, it's something you can do. Um, looking at the rest of the boot time, uh, the largest time are occupied by two things. The first one is the struct page initialization, which takes about 20%. And then there are ACPI operations that take about 30% of the boot time. Uh, when it comes to struct page initialization, um, even with uh, the deferred struct page init option enabled, uh, more than 100 milliseconds are taken to initialize the necessary struct pages. So that's the red box. And then uh, later on, the deferred struct page initialization takes almost between 70 and 100 milliseconds, depends on your kernel. Um, and then uh, from ACPI operations, uh, the total time taken is about 300 milliseconds. That's 30%. Uh, about 100 milliseconds were taken to enable to en the interpreter, uh, another 100 milliseconds for ACPI table load, and then um, going through PCI device idle states also takes quite a bit of time. There probably aren't that many, uh, there, there probably isn't um, a simple solution to solve these pro these times, uh, reduce these times. Uh, when it comes to ACPI, maybe it might be possible to preserve the ACPI namespace across kernel boots, similar to how you preserve RMMU uh, states. Um, using persistent kernel memory, but uh, it would be a very, very invasive kernel change. Um, so, yeah, not not an easy solution for that one. Um, so, in conclusion, um, ideally, we would prefer a downtime of zero. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, a few hundred milliseconds is acceptable, but we are still at one second, so there's still more work that can be done. Uh, for future work, if there's interest in having a PCI device whitelist or blacklist, um, we can start an up, uh, we can start a discussion upstream uh, on the mailing list. Uh, 
it can also be it might also be used for example if you want to probe uh, PCI if you don't want a PCI device probe because it's faulty I mean it can it can have other purposes as well um, then we would also like to start restart the discussion on purgatory but it would be good to hear your opinion on that uh, if that's something you'd be interested in and then in terms of boot time improvements so yeah the biggest chunk that's left is uh, ACPI operations. Um, if there are any power management or ACPI people here, it could be really nice to hear your thoughts on how we can reduce that. So it's oh, awesome. Did you, did you measure which part of ACPI took long? So there were so the, the largest I think was ACPI interpreter enablement and the table load. So I think it's uh, RDS. Like you get the table from RDSP and then it goes on, right? So I think those were the two biggest areas. Interesting. What I remember from our, like, we have this exact same, the exact same problems in the same setup for us in Amazon. Um, the uh, main thing that we have been seeing is uh, CPU object initialization. CPU? CPU object initialization. There is a pull request on ACP ICA right now that we've done to optimize that, if you want to take a look at that. Um, it's getting rejected. I literally just talked to Raphael yesterday. And he doesn't like it, but he has an alternative approach um, where you basically would just remove all the CPU objects, okay, and then you get the same result. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Well, can you go to the next slide about the topics you had? Some. Yeah. So the first thing is regarding the purgatory. There are other people like us as well. I also work with Alex at Amazon that are definitely interested. Like every few milliseconds make a difference, uh, especially for this use case. Yeah, so that, that I think it's definitely worth having those conversations. Um, in terms of the PCI uh, whitelist, blacklist, another option is you don't actually need to reprobe your PCI topology after KXZ, right? It hasn't changed. And in fact, probing PCI and discovering bar sizes and all of that is actually a destructive operation, especially if that device is being passed through to the guest and is actively being used. Um, another option is to use kernel persistent memory and pass your PCI information across from your old kernel to your new kernel. You, you then don't need to pr do actual any actual PCI probing, you know, so, um, yeah. So how do you pass that information? That's, again, well, we have a talk tomorrow, Alex and I, exactly on this. Um, it's called, um, what is the topic? It's something like, yeah, it's something like passing um, guest and host state across during KExec. And we're basically looking at options to do this. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to say that instead of, instead of saying, do probe these devices, don't probe those devices, you can say, just pass across your whole PCI um, information during KExec. So, yeah, so that's like, um... That's one of the things that we have done, for example, for um, the IMME state uh, for VFL PCI devices. We pass that across, but that's simple to do, I guess. This might be a bit more complicated. Yes, um, yeah. I mean, it's a good stop. I just have a question, actually, out of curiosity. The, the vast majority of the devices that uh, you don't need, are they just basically the switches uh, and the bridges of the slots, or do you have actual devices that, that you don't care so about? So it was a combination. I remember, so it's been, it's been some time, but I remember a lot of them were Intel ones. So I am I think they were bridges as well, but they were a lot of Intel devices that I just removed. And it's yeah, changed. system devices of some sort. and yeah. They were system, I think, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I think there's one at the back. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, I also, uh, in my experiments, uh, saw the time I spent in the purgatory. And um, I, I mean, there are two types of uh, KXAC reboots, right? There is a KXAC reboot and then a KXAC load, and then there is KXAC file load. So one goes through the kernel, and another one goes through the purgatory of KXAC tools. Yes. So if it goes through the K uh, purgatory of KXAC tools, that you can, you can modify skip. whatever you want. There, right yes but that's not used in production a lot right so that's the older one if i remember right right so, I, I, I just wanted to mention that, that yes. uh, so there's a skip purgatory option in that <laughs> one but that's i don't think people use that i don't think the code through kxec tools people use that anymore uh, or much more uh, actually 
we, we use it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think but, that's the older way, like I think uh, the newer way is We that. use it for a different reason. We use it actually for um, uh, ex existing bug in VGA and, and uh, uh, Linux boot uses it. Uh, so, so it's actually used in production. But yeah, so that's part of the source code from KXX tools, but the one in the... So, so there's a purgatory in the kernel that doesn't that you can't skip at all. So, so, okay, so but I thought that um, the purgatory. In, uh, so, so is it the same? Do we check uh, SHA for um, only x86 or on ARM as well? Because uh, ARM thought, doesn't go through purgatory, I believe. So this is an Intel. Issue. This, this is Intel only. Okay, because I remember that on ARM that was that if you use KXX tools, it's slow because it uh, we have. A purgatory with the SHA to 56 check, and uh, Might go if we do the KXX5 load, it's much faster because we don't do that in the okay. Uh, okay, and for the struct pages, uh, so you, can you please go back to that slide uh, to the last slide? Uh, so the struct page initialization is now uh, divided into two parts, right? The deferred uh, initialization and then the huge uh, TLBFS. Where you still initialize uh, serially during during boot. So but, the, uh, yeah. the red box is the one that uh, I think those are the kernel decides are the necessary ones that it will need through the oh, boot. Oh, the, the necessary ones. Uh, yes, so that can be reevaluated because uh, that necessary ones. Uh, you might. I said like seven years ago, so and, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. So what. maybe we can reduce that a bit. Yeah, you, you could check that because that that might. might might not be wrong yeah. right anymore. Go ahead, David. No okay. No. Um, just on the struct pages, there's I don't exactly know how this deferred initialization worked, but we posted a patch series of quite a while ago that we called lazy struct page initialization, where basically you only actually initialize the first, the, the topmost node in the in the buddy list, like the two mm -hmm. meg. The, the struct page for the two mega aligned ones. And then as soon as you want to break that down, then you actually go and initialize all of the rest of the pages. So it's like only when you actually try and use it and break that buddy node, okay. then you go and allocate, then you go and, and, yeah, I don't think that was ever merged, but maybe we could look at that again. Um, yeah, that yeah. would be good to look at. I think we called it lazy. Yeah, only when you actually need that, you initialize the, the pages. Okay, I'll have a look. So a bunch of this stuff gets easier once you, go and talk to James and Alex tomorrow about um, mm. passing stuff over from one kernel to the next. And essentially, you sort of build this flattened device tree or something with a whole bunch of information that can be passed from one kernel to the next, and then just go and do a bombing run on everything that takes time, making each individual thing pass over that information. You start with loops per jiffy, for example, which mm. you can do on the command line, and it wastes time. And then you do PCI programming, and then you do a whole bunch of other stuff, hardware, PCI discovery, etc. And then you do KVM, because if you go back to your first slide, you were timing on how long does it take until we get to running in it. But what if you could run your guest CPUs before you even run user space? What if you had an asynchronous um, KVM run, which was running those in a kernel thread or something, and then your BMM can serialize and bugger off before KXEC and your new kernel can start running those vCPUs, as long as they don't do complicated VM exit that actually in, yeah. involves um, VMM doing anything. Yeah. Paolo's looking very concerned. I can um, see his face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we'll get Paolo drunk, it'll be fine. Um, I feel like and I'm you can be running your vCPUs as long as you have posted interrupts and everything else yeah. and don't really need many exits. But I feel um, like that give him a mic. Um, <laughs> Then um, you don't have to wait for user space. I, I'm not concerned. Space. So I'm not concerned, but I have a deja vu because... <laughs> it's almost like no. we have a plan. No, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he didn't manage in the getting me drunk part. But uh, So I, I think uh, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse here because there are two different steps. One is making KXEC fast, and the other is passing stuff uh, from pre-KXEC user space to post-KXEC user space. You're right, yes. It Once is. you have uh, uh, this thing, then you can do all sort of crazy tricks, like also say, by the way, put this into some kind of KVM run as soon as you can. Yeah. 
but I, I, I think this is it a, starts a, with a way to pass from one to the other. Th this is a different uh, thing. And yes. uh, furthermore, uh, like kind of jump starting discussion also for tomorrow. What, what I is, was talking yesterday to Alex, the the task of uh, uh, basically saving the state for post K exec doesn't really need K exec. It's basically snapshotting a, the state of a bunch of file descriptors in such a way that you can keep the kernel memory reserved from when they will be needed again. Yep. And uh, like it doesn't really make sense without K exec, but implementation wise, you can just have a snapshot file descriptor that you push other file descriptors in. On the post K exec part, you get a restore file descriptor that you pull file descriptor out of. It's kind of a key value store for file, for file descriptor metadata. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. Although so, I also have this fantasy of the next step, right? If you look at this, we're, we're turning off these CPUs to go and spin somewhere useless. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we're waking them up to go back in the vCPU. Why couldn't they just stay in guest mode while the BSP goes? I mean, I don't, I, <laughs> but that really does come later. Yeah, well, that's like four or five steps further, but... <laughs> But I think that the important thing, plumbers-wise, is to figure out what is kind of the, the, the user space API abstraction that you want and, uh, and, uh, and what is the, the kernel data that, uh, yeah. that is attached right, to it. It starts with the kernel and how we pass stuff from kernel to kernel. Yeah. And then we look at from kernel. Yeah, and from kernel to kernel is a kind of already a generalization of from uh, user space We've to user space. We've done that for Zen Live Update already. Yeah. I mean, the, and that's where you're going to have a bunch of skeletons because the kernel to kernel you always have the problem is you're going to keep a whole bunch of memory page around, including all your get memory pages. They may be in a location that is now going to be where the new kernel wants to be. And so... Um, that's fixable. We fixed it for them. That's right. fine. Yeah. You don't see it like a location that's next to the and then you need to main block to know about not walking over all of the, those places. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of things there because the main block allocator doesn't know about all your pages. Yeah, it's fixable. It's complicated, but it's. I mean, it's complicated, right? There, there is a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, you've done it already. And another thing with the guest MFD that would be worth looking at, especially if you want to have reserve pools for just KVM, is gifting memory from guest MFD to KVM for things like page tables, so that when you free up memory, like say you're managing at one gig granularity and you want to tax the guest and take from the guest and not from your small reserve pool for the host. You don't have to reconstitute a huge page when you give it back to the kernel because it's just always just KVM is allocating one gig chunks. You have to make sure you're not like one gig plus one byte and then you're just burning yeah. two gigs, but you got some flexibility there. I think mm -hmm. that's a solvable problem. And then of course in flight DMA is the fun. The oh, fun that's part. fine. The EPT stays in place. The in-flight DMA. Yeah. In-flight DMA has to keep working if you can't cause the assigned well, devices. That's, that's all fine. The EPT stays in place. You can even collect posted interrupts into a PID while it's still running. Well, well, just to, it, it all falls so, out eventually. As long as we solve the problem of the PCI state, because a new kernel will... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, we can't let the probing happen, basically. In there is an order the, in which we do these things, but in, it's fine. In-flight DMA has the problem that also you need to not reinitialize, of course, the PCI devices. So that goes into what he was saying. Yeah, that only IOM and you. And IOMU and everything. Yeah, so yeah, it goes yeah. into what he was saying. The, well, you don't have to reconstruct, to reuse the IOMU page tables. If you want, you can just pass down the MEM slots, whatever VFIO calls them, and flip the PACID atomically in the new kernel once you have, uh, you have finished uh, building the, the IOMU page tables, if you want. Otherwise, you can keep them. I don't know I what's know, easier. We build them, we just use them. But yes. well, I don't know what's easier of the two, but yeah. yes. But yeah, all this is all this is doable. Yeah. It starts with a way to pass information from one kernel to the next, and then we just I build the, up. I think the important part is to find a decent first step. I think the important part is figuring out a decent first step that gives you something and gives you kind of the momentum to go to the next yeah, steps. Nice, because right? otherwise, you... So, so my, you have a huge thing to do and you don't... Uh... Well, I'm, I'm completely with you. I think that the very first base fundamental framework we need to solve, which is exactly why we have the presentation tomorrow, yeah. um, is how do we pass memory as well as metadata from one kernel to the next through KXEC in a standardized, backwards compatible, ideally, fashion, right? And 
what I currently have hacked up, and it's it's kind of working, is a, um, a couple of patches that basically take uh, like do do a serialization path on the KX -like down down path when you, when you go go off, um, create a device tree, as in data structure, not as in the actual elements of it. Just the, the data structure of a device tree. Serialize metadata into a device tree with a standardized um, nomenclature of the memory of memory ranges, and then I can, on the way back, reassemble my um, memory slot, my, my boot. What's it called again? Uh, the the what? No, the, the boot boot memory array. Uh, the what? No, not the, the other one. The one the one that's in Linux. The mem blocks. Yes, I can I can reinitialize mem blocks. I couldn't hear you. I can, I can realize a membox based on that one and then uh, have all the memory re 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 reserved again and then on the driver unit side, pull all, every piece in, again out of the device tree, reassemble it with driver specifics and you're done, right? And that gives you a base framework. What I've enabled right now is ftrace because that's a super obvious use case. Right? You can actually trace all the way down to reboot syscall um, and do things that are sensible um, without talking about... Uh, justifications of 100 milliseconds of boot time and things. <clears throat> um, but once we have this framework in, I think we can very easily go further. And we've had this working for Zen for a couple of years. We've done much the same thing using the Zen guest transparent live migration ABI. And we just pass that stream and we don't use it for live migration in space. We use it for live migration in time to the next mm -hmm. instance of Zen on the same machine. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't free those pages into its buddy, buddy allocator as it starts up and just continues to use them, all the guest pages and everything. Yeah. Um, and it, it just works. Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is going to figure out uh, acceptable upstream way of having a generic hook into the struct device or what, whatever they for drivers to have the opportunity to serialize state and recover state and yeah. including bus drivers because we don't want to probe, especially PCI, which is destructive. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the uh, back shading is going to happen. But that's where we play whack-a-mole, right? We get yeah. the mechanism in place first, and then we go and deal yeah. with all the things that we And PCI is going to be the big one. Yep. Yeah. And I own them. Well, we can clone a Greg and... For the KVM side of things, have you guys actually gotten to I mean, the point big, so you where you're having fun stuff. run? Okay. Have you gotten to the point where you're able to keep the guests running without too many explosions? Um, with in place EPT. Keep the guests running as in while we're doing KXEC or? Uh, maintaining, using the EPT tables from the previous kernel. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, it's hackish. It's not something we're proud of right now. We want That's to do this properly now. Gonna, but yeah, it, where it I'm works. shining with this is I think on the x86 side, we should seriously consider either revamping mem slots or moving away from them. Uh, we have a lot of tech debt there in terms of ABI that really hamstrings us. Yes, <laughs> I have other thoughts on that issue, and yes. And Aside from the cleanliness of it, the ABI problems that we have. Yeah, oh yeah, there's lots of things, I, but I mean, just from a, yeah. like we have a, I've wanted to, like my white whale is the whole VFIO thing where there's a hidden flush that KVM has to delete every single EPT entry when you change a mem slot. It kills me. So I just, I just want to point out we haven't tried to keep the actually using the EPTs while the K exec is happening. What we've kept is the, the page tables used by IMMU. I don't know if that's what you mean by EPTs, but we keep oh, the sorry, no, I meant for So the, the VCPUs. Yeah, yeah. We're not in guest mode during K exec. Um, that, that's a nice like. Oh yeah, that's what I was asking. If you had the EPT, because th there's also a ton of stuff in KVM that yeah. assumes that, you that's have like the, the current process MM struct running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, it's not just there's like a whole pile of stuff. Like the total north in. star here is actually to stay in guest mode. Yeah, yeah I was asking if you got that running part yet. No, so far it's okay. just it's just keep DMA running. Okay. while the vcpus are not running but and you're doing kx yeah i guess when we david you do yeah there's well, just space, yeah. you've got that mini piece of code which is its own thing and it will have to funk back into real linux and it can just wait until linux has come back from kx yes right there and are options all these jigsaw puzzle pieces do eventually come together in in my fantasy but 
we'll see if we get yeah well, i guess where i was going with that is with the especially with the guest mmfd stuff and kvm side there's definitely if if we're gonna do any kind of redesign or extensions now is the right time to do it not three years from now or at least we should be thinking about it so we don't come up with something that's as frankenstein as mem slots yes absolutely Um, so, uh, I, I think about like five years ago, the PQRM patches were proposed uh, as a way to preserve the kernel memory, but uh, I think the, the biggest problem that, that uh, I had with, the, uh, with those patches was that uh, they can lead to fragmentation. So when uh, the next time, uh, even you reboot kernel many times over and over again, uh, you, get, you, get, you can have um, uh, uh, like unmovable pages uh, in random places, uh, and uh, eventually what you can have is like kernel that just not bootable because of like uh, not long enough uh, memory segments available uh, that are presumed by the first. So I was just uh, thinking if um, if whatever like we decide in terms of like a standard interface how to preserve the kernel memory across the boots that it should also. Uh, prevent the fragmentation from happening like when, when we do multiple exactly boots of the kernel. I understand the question. So PKRAM, that's uh, PKRAM, uh, that's Oracle, that's something that Oracle proposed uh, in 2018, I think. Yeah. And uh, what it allows, so it builds a, a of uh, memory ranges that needs to be preserved across the key exactly boot that can be preserved within the kernel. But the problem is that uh, it can lead to fragmentation so that uh, at some point you're just not able to even allocate like a memory map or something like long enough to... But why should that be cumulative? Why can't we move the pages once we've got them? Yes, they're in a certain place and we have to avoid them as we're booting. But as soon as we're booted, nothing should be pinned. We should be able to move anything we like, right? So early in boot, uh, before those pages are actually used, there is like a, maybe some uh, like mem block allocator, some early kernel boot code that require. Uh, like, uh, yeah, you need to. You prevent. need to have enough contiguous memory or yes, yes. some complexity so early boot mem can work. But yeah. that's okay because you just ensure. Well, the way we've done it in Zen is we ensure that you don't do any persistent allocations from that region. And you can achieve that by moving them out of that region before you okay, yeah, as yes, well, yes. if you want. You, you, I'm going to move, migrate any page that's in my, and then you, we give the new kernel, this is the region you can use for your boot memory. This is where we're going to load you. And then you go and parse the data stream that, and work that's out. That's exactly what I'm lab. saying, is that we need to guarantee that we do not uh, cause this kind of fragmentation because uh, PKRAM today can. And uh, we need to guarantee that uh, before we reboot. That yeah. no, 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 we know how to do this. This is the thing I was saying to Ben a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's complex. We're not going to discuss it here when we're already out of time, but it, it's, it's fixed. It's fixable. It should be boot memory in the old world as a contiguous physical memory array. And then everything after doesn't need large allocations, and you're good yeah, until you're actually at a point where you can have flexible uh, memory allocation. Again. You're fine. This is it, it's a tractable problem. Yes, it's mm -hmm. right. We are done. Thank you. Thank you.